Judy, you've mentioned in prior articles that you are interested in themes of righting a wrong, so to speak. How would you advise other documentarians or even narrative filmmakers to show, quote, like a wrong without actually having a strong bias toward um, your own opinion toward it? Or is that part of your filmmaking? I mean, how, how can a documentarian stay a little bit removed from their own feelings of showing something? Or is that part of what makes a film great, is your strong feeling about it? Yeah, I don't think you want to remove your feelings from your documentary. Otherwise, you have no passion to do it. The subject matter has to have some kind of resonance in you in a very deep way. And uh, to try to be unbiased, well, that's like doing a broadcast network news report. And certainly that's not the job of a documentarian, uh, as I see it. I think a documentarian is there to express an opinion. And if other people agree with it, then they like your film. And if they don't, then they don't like your film. So with the girls in the band, what was it that struck your interest in it? And how did you first start with the, the beginning interview? What was the first step? Well, I've always searched for subjects that have some kind of personal meaning for me. and. Um, the, the imbalance of male and female endeavors in this world has a great deep meaning for me. And it's a subject that has always interested me. I've always been part of the women's movement in you know the 70s and the 80s and uh, was very involved with developing a lot of different organizations that women, uh, that support women. So the subject of a woman's role in the world and how it's perceived and how women have to operate in the world to get to where they want to go is very important to me. And the fact that I come from a musical family and music has been a very deep part of my life since the very beginning uh, was another very important thread in in the tapestry of my life. So when these two subject matters came together in this story it was a natural for me, and uh, that's what attracted me to it, and that's what kept me going for the eight years it took to make it. Do you remember some of the first steps in organizing the film or going and piecing together who you wanted to interview? Do you remember some of the first things that you did? Well, the, uh, the subject matter was, was brought to my attention by a young friend of mine who called me up one day, and she also is from a musical family, and she said that she had met a woman who was 80 years old and told her that she had played in a big band in the 40s, and that she was a drummer. And I said, oh, I don't think so. I know all the big bands, and I remember most of the musicians who were in the big bands, and I never saw a woman play in any of them. And she said, well, this woman said that she was, and why don't you look her up? So I did. And when I looked her up and discovered that, yes, in fact, this woman had been part of big bands, mainly they were all women big bands, but that there were all women big bands, I, it really was, was rather stunning to me because I didn't know anything about this. So I started doing research. And the more research I did, the more I discovered. And the more I discovered, the more I realized that I'm not the only one who doesn't know about this. My husband, who's a musician, he never heard of any of these women. And then I started asking other male friends who were musicians. They never heard of any of them. And then I said, oh, oh, there's something here. And that was kind of the beginning of it. And uh, actually, I got in touch with a woman named Roz Cron, who lives here, who somebody had recommended to me, said, you ought to talk to her because she was a woman musician in the 40s. And she was the first person that I talked to. And that started the whole thing. So how much research would you say you did ahead of time before you actually shot your first interview? I think we probably worked for about a year uh, just developing a uh, kind of a concept and talking to people and getting to know people and I did go out and interview Roz personally not on camera but I talked to her and then I talked to a couple of other people who were around because I just wanted to get a sense of if there was a story here. And not only if there was a story here, but if these women were actually good enough so that they 
could have played with any of the big male bands or that they could have been an influence on the music. And that took me a long time to really feel certain about. I had to really listen to a lot of music and, and hear what these women were laying down as players before I really said, wow, these women were really good. It, they weren't just novelty acts, which is how they were portrayed. So that was, a, that was a very powerful moment when I realized that. Would you recommend to other documentarians that they kind of almost dip their toe in the water a little bit, get a feel for the subject, find out whether there's enough material to cover, whether they can stay sort of married to it for years, and work from there, or should they just kind of come with this big grandiose plan and, and commit to it? What do you think is the best approach? I think the best approach is however you feel it. You have to feel it, you have to love it, you have to be willing to stick with it, and you have to be realistic about it. I think one of the things you have to ask yourself is, one, is there an audience for this? And two, is there gonna be any funding for it? Am I going to be able to find ways to fund this film? And if your subject matter is so narrow focused that there isn't anybody who really is going to put money into it, you're going to be on a pretty frustrating ride for a while. But if there is an audience and if there is a way to fund it, then it doesn't matter how long it takes you. If it's your passion, then you have to do it. Certainly some pre-production helps and dipping your toe in to see if, you know, what it's like out there helps. But I don't think there's any one way to do it. Can we talk about funding for the girls in the band? You said you started eight years ago. What was the first step you took with trying to find backers for the film? The first thing that I did was go to a friend of mine named Michael Green, who had been the uh, head of NARIS. That's the group that gives out the Grammy Awards. And I had known Michael for about 15 years. And um, I called him up and said, I have a project that I think you might be interested in. So he said, well, what is it? So I told him briefly on the phone. He said, well, what have you got on it? I said, well, right now all I have is a bunch of pictures and some stories. So I had, a photo I had photographs. I made a book, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, a, a, a folder that had a lot of, of the photographs of the women in it, and I wrote up the stories of each of them that I had done after this year of research. And I went up to see Michael and gave him the book. And he said, yeah, this looks interesting. What do you want? And I said, I want enough money to make a demo reel. And he said, okay, I'll give you the money. So we did, we went out and we shot our first interviews and we did a seven minute demo reel. And with that demo reel, we then went out to major funders and started asking for money for the project. So that was our first steps. And then 2008 hit. Yeah. After we had gotten our initial money, which we got from two very wonderful major sources, um, we had shot most of our footage. And now it was time to start the very expensive post-production aspect of the film. And the uh, money crunch of 2008 hit. And it isn't that everything melted down or dried up, it's just that everybody got scared. And the first thing everybody did was tighten their purse strings. So all the potential people and organizations and foundations that we were writing proposals for and that we were personally contacting and wooing all just said, sorry, the doors are closed. We're not doing any funding. And that put a really big, put us on the skids for a while. So we turned to the alternatives, which are small donors, uh, little fundraisers, an Indiegogo campaign. And we just struggled along for a couple years to try to get ourselves back on track and to keep going so that the project wouldn't, you know, wouldn't die. So it was, a, it was a long and difficult time. 
and in this past year things have started coming back and finally we got the money to do our uh, the major major expense of the film which was our rights our music rights and uh, once that happened we could finish going back to when some of those major donors you know got scared or weren't able to commit to you did you ever feel like you were going to give up on the project was that ever oh, something no. you entertained no <laughs> you knew that somehow no. you get it done. Okay. Yeah. you know <laughs> you can't give up on your your life's work uh, you know this was this was a major a major work for me and somehow I knew it would get finished I hoped that it wouldn't take eight years but it did because you know we had that major stop in the middle and uh, but you know if it had taken ten years we would have done it so we're happy it didn't um, tell me about the fundraisers I'm curious about that because you also used Indiegogo but what were some of the fundraisers about well we did um, a lot of online outreach fundraising where we would just write a, a really compassionate fundraising letter and send it to key people and ask them who they would suggest we send it to. And through that we started increasing our, our fan base and our funding base. And you know I would send it to a friend in San Francisco who would send it to a friend of hers in San Francisco who sent it to a friend of his in San Diego who turned out to be an heiress who came through with a large chunk of money. So that was kind of the, the net that we were weaving to, to pull the money in. And then we actually did a, a major fundraising uh, up at the Playboy Mansion, which uh, Hugh Hefner who was one of our producers, threw for us. So that was very helpful. So some of it was sort of six degrees of separation, people who knew someone. Exactly, knew someone. exactly. And then at what point did you try Indiegogo? What year was it? Um, it was, uh, I think, 2010 we tried Indiegogo because uh, that kind of fundraising had just become popular and we tried every other kind so we thought well why not Indiegogo so we went and did an Indiegogo campaign and uh, we asked for $15,000 and um, we got it but I gotta tell you that was hard money to raise I think everybody has this notion that you go on Indiegogo and there's hundreds of people out there who want to fund films and no mostly it's your friends and their friends and it's Re it's intense work and then you have to give gifts to everybody you know everybody does it for perks and so it's very intensive so did it almost feel like a full-time job what, oh whatever? it was a full-time oh, job okay. right. yes yes the Indiegogo campaign took us three months to fulfill everything and to you know to raise all the money and then fulfill all the obligations that we had promised we had promised people t-shirts and posters and things like that and then we had to mail all that out it was it was very intensive so do you remember what you did on a daily basis during the actual live campaign was it was it again more emails to people and sharing the link Emails, phone calls, um, I had a lot of lunches, I met with a lot of people who uh, were interested but wanted to kind of have a personal contact. It's a very personal business, fundraising for something like this. And you never know who's going to lead you to somebody else, you know. You have drinks with somebody and you think they're going to give you $10,000 and they never come through with anything and then three months later they send a friend your way who gives you ten thousand dollars so it's not it's not a direct science that's for sure what would you recommend to another filmmaker who's considering launching a crowdfunding campaign and has a beautiful project but maybe they don't have the contacts maybe they don't know that many people or some of the people that they know aren't able to give would you how would you advise them to gauge what their audience is? You know, I, that's a, a question that I really don't have an answer for. Um, my experience with Indiegogo was very personal to me, and I know that the people who gave on Indiegogo were all somehow personally linked to me. Um, I think there's a bit of a fantasy out there right now that you can just go on 
to uh, Kickstarter or Indiegogo and put your project up there and people will come seeking you. But I don't think that really happens. I think it's really a dirty, down in the dirt, hard struggle. If somebody knows different than me, I'd like to hear from them. But that's the way I perceive it. Would you advise someone who's maybe failed at crowdfunding to kind of dust themselves off and regroup and try again? Because so many people, I think they become, and understandably, you're hurt, you're upset, hey, my campaign failed, and then you shy away from it. Would you advise people to just get back on the horse and try it again and give it some time? Well, I think uh, any pursuit that you do in life is filled with failures and successes, and you often learn more from your failures than your success. So, um, you know, of course you have to pick yourself up. What else? <laughs> You're gonna lie in the dirt the rest of your life? <laughs> it's not an option. Judy, your experience with crowdfunding was back in 2010 when it was still sort of a novelty. Your thoughts now that it's passed, you were successful, you raised, what, 15,000? What's your thoughts on it now that it's passed? Well, the time it took, the intensity of it, I had three people working on it for three months. The $15,000 probably just barely paid our salary during those months, or their salaries, because I didn't take a salary. It paid their salaries during those months and left some money for us to stay operating. I think now, looking back on it, because it might have been fairly new at that time and people weren't familiar with it. We were educating our fan base as to what it was. Um, I think my time might have been better used just going knocking on doors the way I had been doing and I probably could have raised at least that much. Uh, maybe today it's different. Maybe people know more about what these crowdfunding sources are and are more willing. But then I, I felt I could have used my time better, frankly. Right now, everything's you know on Twitter or on Facebook. Hey, look at my link, and that's great. That's that's how things spread these days and spread very quickly. But do you think the sort of the old way of just going and seeing someone face to face is the power of that is? I, I think in certain areas that's true. There are certain people at a certain level of success that you do have to engage one-on-one. -on -one. I think there's nothing wrong with getting your word out there to massive audiences on Twitter and Facebook and all of that. I think all of that stuff is important for a filmmaker. Um, but you can't ever replace that sitting down with somebody and looking them in the eye and saying, I need this or my film will not be completed and you know, touching them on a heart level so that they write that check out. And I think maybe if you're new in this business and you're young and you don't have those social skills, that's something you're gonna need to work on because you need to be a well-rounded fundraiser. <laughs> I hate to say that. You need to be a well-rounded filmmaker. And part of it is having human interaction. Well, especially, too, for people that are used to dealing with computers, and some say that younger generations lack that social skill, you know, whether it's true or not. How would someone learn that? Yeah, that's a great, it's almost like um, people that are in development and, 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 you know, fundraising and all that. Where do you go to learn those skills, sort of the courting that goes on with getting to know someone? It's really helpful to have a mentor. If you find somebody in the business who has been there, done that, who's gone down those roads, they can help you. And, and it's really important to get that help. Um, I know that even myself, with all the experience that I've had in the business, my executive producer, Mike Green, who gave me the first money, is a man who has operated on such high levels in the business and in the industry that the skills that he showed me while I was making this film were invaluable to me. And then just the other day, a, a young filmmaker who volunteered to do some work for us while we were in New York screening at Lincoln Center 
uh, she was telling me about a problem that she was having on a film that she was doing. And she asked me if I thought it would be a good idea for her to confront the person at a major studio face to face who was giving her trouble. And I was able to say to her, you know, what you're going to do is going to alienate you and that person and is not going to further your work in any way. It may bring you momentary satisfaction, but is that what you're looking for? Maybe you need to rethink this whole thing. And so I was able to share something with her that I have learned. And I think that's what we all have to do for each other. All filmmakers have to mentor other people. So your advice to her was to maybe handle it in a different way, maybe more graciously? Not only more graciously, but to look at what she was in pursuit of and to look what her other options were and to see why it is that she wanted to confront this person and what she was going to get out of it, to just really think about her position because it's a very small business and going out there and alienating people in positions that you are going to come across again as you climb the ladder is never a good idea. You know, we all make mistakes along the way and we all pay for them. How did Hugh Hefner become involved with the project? Is he co-producer? He is now the produ a producer. producer. We okay. upped him from co-producer to producer when he came through with all our uh, uh, music rights in the end. Yes, the balance of what was owed on the music rights he picked up and allowed us to finish the film. Um, we first got involved with him when, uh, after Mike Green did the original, um, funded the original Seven Minutes, I was sending it out to major people in the industry, and one of the people I sent it to was Herb Albert, who had funded uh, my Blacklist film, partially funded that. And so I told him I was doing another documentary, and would he be interested? And he took a look at the seven minutes and called me and said, um, we will give you a matching grant. So he did a very generous matching grant. And uh, then I had to go out. I had one year to match it. And then he went out and uh, I had to go out and get the matching money. So uh, I didn't know where I was going to get matching grant for $75,000. So, uh, but I was on the board of the IDA, and Sandra Rausch, who was the, uh, the then executive of the IDA board, uh, I asked her, you know, you've been around this a long time, who do you think might be interested in funding this? And she said, you know, you Hefner might, because he's got this big jazz festival, and he certainly loves women, so uh, he seems like a natural. And she put me in touch with his associate, who, uh, Dick Rosenzweig, who brought the project to Hef, and they immediately came on board. So and that was it. The fundraiser that you did, how, how did that happen? And it was at the Playboy uh, Mansion? Yes. Well, uh, when we got to the point where we had to raise the money for our music rights, I just didn't know which way to turn, so I called Dick up and I said, listen, we need to do some kind of fundraiser to uh, raise the money for the music rights, and do you think that Hef might be willing to do something up at the match? And I mean, after all, he is the co-producer. He was just co-producer at that time. And he said, well, let me ask him. And of course, Hef said yes. We went up there and we did a fundraiser, and uh, in a small theater they had there, and we raised about half the music rights. And um, then at the end, I had to start going out and beating on the other doors again and trying to get the rest of the music rights. And so one of the doors that I beat on was halves again. I, I think I sent out an email to my top 10 funders and said, this is the letter I hoped I never would have to send you. But we now are at a stopping place. We cannot release the film until we pay for the music rights. And then a couple of people came back to me with something. And then Hef came in and said, all right, how much more do you need? And I told him. And he said, OK, we'll cover it. And he did. 
and voila, we were on our way. So now he's the producer. We can't thank him enough. He's been so wonderful, so supportive, and you know, has never had any kind of hand on, never had anything, told us anything to do with the film, just, you know, go make your film. So that's the best, best kind of partner you could have. Going back to when you did the fundraiser, what were some of the first steps to organize it? What, what were some of the things that you have? Food, music, like what, what did it entail? Well, the Playboy Mansion took care of all the food. Uh, they took care of the whole party aspect of it. Um, we provided the film and they gave us mailing lists and we collecting mailing lists was the biggest job. And we collected the mailing lists and sent out invitations, got responses and went and had a great party. So to another filmmaker who wants to fundraise, you first need to find the venue, probably, and then see if you could get any kind of donated entertainment, food, drinks, things like that. Yeah, I, I, it, we didn't really want to have any entertainment because the film is this actually, actually the centerpiece. So we had uh, a wonderful buffet afterwards, and a friend of ours, Kimberly Bailey, baked us the most gorgeous girls in the band cake, which was a picture of our logo. And, uh, it, you know, that was the, sort of the centerpiece of, of the end of the party. But it was really just, uh, we were there for the film, and there was a Q&A afterwards, and, you know, people stuck around and talked, picked, talked and took photos, and that's what the event was. Would you advise that people send out invitations through regular U.S. mail or email? No, we sent out, I think we sent out a, um, you know, kind of a paperless post invitation for that, I think. No, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. For that, we did send out mail. We sent out mail invitations and we had cards printed up uh, that people RSVP'd on and sent out envelopes like you were being invited to something really fancy. Yeah, we did do that for that. We've sent every kind of invitation and every kind of email imaginable. It's been a, a real learning curve on how to get people to your screenings and how to do that kind of stuff. Do you think the art of fundraising for films is a lost, is a little bit of a lost art now that crowdfunding's around? Or do you think it still coexists, but it seems like now everyone's turned to crowdfunding, which again is wonderful. But I'm just wondering with the fundraising, I don't know. I, I really don't know how other people are fundraising. Um, I think uh, I think the filmmakers that I know are all doing the same thing that I did. They're all beating down the doors because you have to go to places for grants. You have to go to foundations. You have to go to the NEH and the NEA, and you know those things all take uh, a lot of a lot of intensive work. Judy, you've referenced beating down doors, knocking down doors a few times. What does that entail, and how can one do it graciously? Or maybe not so graciously. I think you have to have a lot of patience, and you have to know that it's not one phone call, that it's many phone calls that you'll be making, that you'll come back to the same people over and over and over again. It's, uh, it's a matter of getting people comfortable with you, of getting them on your side. So instead of thinking that you're going out to raise money, you have to think that you're going out to woo people, to bring them into your camp, to make them part of your support system, to just get their enthusiasm for your project. And, you know, if the money isn't forthcoming immediately, that doesn't mean it's not going to come in the long run, and it doesn't mean that they're not gonna be able to help you in some other way. So I think it's almost like gathering your tribe around your project, getting people who see your passion and believe in you. So I think that's the attitude you have to go in with, so. When is no really a no? Sometimes I think people say, well, they don't take no for an answer, but I think sometimes the person might be saying no, not to be malicious, but maybe just they truly can't give whatever it is that you are asking for. And how do you still interact with that person after that? I think that you have to have a real sense of 
of where people are coming from, of what's going on with them that makes this possible for them or not. And you have to live within the reality of that. And maybe a no is a no now, but is not a no in the future. And, and then, you know, there's some people who say, take me off your list. Well, if they say that, then it's a no. <laughs> you say, okay, we're sorry we bothered you. And, you know, you have to do that too, because you will be bothering a lot of people who don't want to be bothered about this, who have their own problems or their own projects that they're raising money for. So you just have to be very sensitive uh, every step of the way. And I think to responding to someone that maybe does say take you, you know, take me off the list and doing it in a, a pleasant way or at least closing the door in a, in a favorable way because we're hurt, you know, we feel like, oh, well, they don't believe in us. I don't think you can afford to be hurt. <laughs> you, <laughs> your, your personal feelings have got to be left on the doorstep somewhere else. You are in a very, very difficult and dynamic situation when you're fundraising, and there really is no room for personal feelings of hurt or rejection. That's you got to just get rid of that. <laughs> it's not useful to you in any way. This is just a job you're doing, and you won't be successful at every phase of it, but overall you will be successful, and that's what you look for. And that same notion would apply as well to actually just being in the business, whether you're an actor, filmmaker, composer, what have you, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. It is not an easy business. <laughs> and if you do that, I, someone, I forget where I read this, said to develop rhino skin, where just stuff just doesn't affect you anymore. Was that something that you were able to do over a course of time, or were you always pretty thick-skinned? No, no, I was not thick-skinned. I was your, your typical uh, fragile young girl who was easily hurt. Uh, but, you know, you, you learn. You get out there and you tough it out and you learn, and, and that's what you do. And then all of a sudden you wake up one day and say, hey, you know, that doesn't bother me anymore. I don't care. Who are they? <laughs> you know, you're, you're who you are, and that's, that's what you're searching for all the time. And once you find that, once you find your own personal strength, nobody can shake that. I have a little sign that I put on my computer that another producer said, I found it in, I don't know, some magazine, it said, if anyone says no to you and you're discouraged for one second, you're dead. Uh, okay, meaning I cannot indulge myself in any kind of uh, self-pity whatsoever. I got too many other people to talk to who are going to say yes. That has been a real help for me. Judy, I understand you were part of the AFI's uh, directing workshop for women. Yes. Where were you in your life when you first walked in those doors? Um, I had been an actress for about 12 years and I had had a moderate, moderately successful career, but at some point it was not satisfying to me artistically because the kind of roles, the work that I was doing was never anything that artistically satisfied me except some stuff that I did in the theater. And um, one day a, a friend of mine called me up. I, I was on a, a women's committee at the Screen Actors Guild and another woman on the committee called me up and said, that her husband was doing a, um, a film shoot and needed an assistant and did I know anybody because I had uh, a young son at the time. She thought maybe my son would want to be an assistant. And she said, "You did I know anybody who would want to be a, a production assistant? And I said, yes, me. And she said, you? I said, yeah, I want to try getting on the other side of the camera to see what's going on there. So I took that job, and they hired me to be a, a, a production assistant for this commercial company. And at that time, I said, this is where I want to be. I don't want to be on the other side of the camera. This is where I feel creative. I feel energetic. I love what I'm doing. I feel like myself. And at that time, the uh, AFI had just started to do the directing workshop for women. and. Uh, 
another friend of mine was doing a project there. She had been accepted into the workshop, Lenore de Coven, and she needed an assistant to help on her film. And I said, oh, yeah, I'd like to do that. So I helped her uh, get her film made. And once I was done with that, I said, oh, this is great. I want to be in this program. And at that time, they were taking ma mainly people who were already successful in the industry, women who had writing careers or who had directed on Broadway or who were stars. They had a lot of well-known actresses, Anne Bancroft and Joanne Woodward and people like that were in the program. But I applied to the program. And I didn't get in, but what I got was on the wait list in case somebody dropped out. There were like three of us on the wait list. And about three months into the program, uh, somebody dropped out, a writer dropped out of the program. And they called me and said, Judy, you want to be in the program, you're in. And I said, this is, this is it, here I am. And so that's how I got into the program. What were some of the basic things they taught you? I've heard that AFI has a very distinct style. I could be wrong, it was just a couple of things I'd read, but what were some of the things that they taught you and that were different maybe from other places that you've worked? At that point, there was very little instruction. What you did was spend a day with a technician who taught you how to plug in all your equipment, who taught you how to run an editing system, and at that time we were editing in one inch large editing. And um, I, had, I had done a radio show before, and so I had edited tape before. I had edited the little quarter inch audio tape, and I was pretty skilled at it. So uh, when we got to editing the one inch tape, that was great, I loved that. And um, I will never forget, he gave us instruction and he said, just think of electronics as electronic plumbing. You plug a thing in here, the current goes in there. You plug it in there, the current goes there. It's just like water running through pipes. And for some reason, that weird description served me great. It really made me understand that it was nothing mysterious, that it was very simple, and I just seemed to have an affinity for it. And that was basically all the instruction we got. Then after that, they gave you the equipment, they gave you a small amount of money, and they gave you access to everything at AFI, and you went out and made your film. And it was, you know, they threw you out, out of the nest, and you flew. Or you didn't, but fortunately, I flew. Did they have any type of guide come with you? Um... What, no? You, no. You learn how to use no. it, and there you go. You got yourself a producer who you worked with, and you struggled. You made mistakes, and, and, and you did it right, and you did it wrong, and you were free to do whatever you wanted. It may be different now. I think now there's a lot more guidance goes on. I know there's a whole intense month that the women put in with classes and trainings. Uh, my associate producer, Erin Lee, is now in the program. And I know she's just come through a really intensive month of training. But the difference in the program now is they don't give you any money. They make you go out and raise your money, uh, I think, on Kickstarter. So, you know, the world has changed for the better and for the worse. What time period? Uh, were you looking at from the moment it, you started once the wait list fixed, you know? Uh, uh, what time period? Uh, in, yeah, in the, in the program? In the program. It's a year. Oh, it's a year. It's okay. a year program because mm -hmm. they, they bring in a whole new group every year. So you have a year in the program to do whatever you're going to do. Right. And is this a short film? Short film, okay. yes. Mm -hmm. Right. And they let you choose any genre? Yeah. Yeah, I think we did submit scripts and got a go-ahead or a yay or a nay, depending on whether they thought it, we were thinking too out of the box or, you know, crazy stuff that couldn't possibly be done. But mine got approved and I shot a short film. And then do they have a screening? Yes, they, they have a screening. They have a screening every year of all the films of all the women that are in the program. And uh, it, it's, a, it's wonderful to see how many women are getting a shot because one of the things about being a filmmaker is you have to practice. You have to practice your skills. And it's not, you know, like picking up a guitar and you sit in a room by yourself. 
you you need a whole crew. You need equipment. You need money. You need. And sometimes I would say to myself, "Am I crazy? What am I doing here?" But if you're driven, you can't help it. You're crazy anyway. Do you remember some of the first days that when you were sort of quote out of the nest with the camera, some of the things that happened just being out there. I'm not quite sure how many people were on your crew, or, but just some of the things that happened. Um. I do remember shooting one day that was like, I think a 19 hour day where I just practically killed my crew. And for some reason I was so wired, I didn't even know how long it was taking or what time it was or anything. I just knew I had a limited amount of time and a limited amount of days. And you're really guerrilla shooting the whole time. And at the end of it, I thought, wow, that's not something I really want to be doing to a crew. Now, this happens on feature films all the time, but it's not good. And you know, in Europe, they're very civilized. They break like at six o'clock and they come back the next morning and they have tea and you know, but here it's like work. <laughs> so, uh, I wasn't crazy about doing that. Judy, I saw a quote from you somewhere where it said, never give up or stop dreaming. You may have to do a lot less meaningful work along the way to sustain yourself, but you have to hold on to your dreams. And I think that's a boat that a lot of indie people, whether it's music, whatever, are in. Can you tell us about some of the times that you had to do some less meaningful work and how you kept sort of that prize of what you really wanted in the back of your mind to keep you going? Well. Uh, the, the phrase less meaningful is, is, is relative because it may be less meaningful to you artistically and soulfully, but there's another part of the business. There are several parts of the business that you have to take care of, and one of them is to learn how to sustain yourself financially, how to make a living in the business, and what it takes to do that. And the things that are most satisfying to your heart and soul are not the things that are generally going to bring you the most money. So I have at times taken jobs on television shows mostly where um, either I wasn't enthralled with the subject matter or it wasn't something that represented how I felt about things. But nevertheless, there was a lot to learn from it and just learning how to operate in that world, uh, learning what it takes to make a product get to market and what it takes to sustain a product. Uh, these are all valuable lessons. So when I would go into one of these projects, I would look for the thing in it that I didn't know that I would learn from it. And on that level, I could always find a way to enjoy what I was doing. Sometimes it would get to me after a long time uh, because uh, being a woman director, what was offered to me a lot of times was um, more reality oriented things and some of them had gruesome subject matter that I really wasn't something I wanted to deal with. You know, sometimes it would get to me. And if it got to me too much, I'd walk. I'd say, you know, this is not for me anymore. But finding ways to learn something on every project that I was on, getting something out of it, making more connections in the world, advancing my career in other ways, those were things that I learned from having to do things that weren't from my heart. It sounds like that was your mantra then for maybe getting up in the morning and going somewhere that maybe wasn't horrible, but it just wasn't what your passion was, was what can I learn from this? Yes, exactly. And what about times when people say, I just can't do this anymore? How do you know your breaking point? You had said there were times when you did have to walk away. I think that before you walk away from something, you wrestle with it a long time. And, uh, you know, you always have that moment where you sit quietly and talk to yourself and you say, what am I giving up if I leave? What am I gaining if I stay? What am I gaining if I leave? And 
you make your decision. And sometimes life steps in and tells you that it's time for you to go. Something happens, you know, in your life that says, oh, okay, I'm not supposed to be doing this anymore. And so you just kind of listen to it as you go along. Would you give yourself a time period? Let's say you accepted something that, again, wasn't horrible, but it wasn't where you wanted to be. Would you say, okay, I can do this for a year? I'm, that's never worked for me. I don't know why. I know other people say, in three years, I want to be here. And I, when I say that, it's like, oh my God, I put a pressure on myself that I can't possibly deal with. Oh, it's almost like I have to live it organically day to day and say, where am I today on this? You know, how, what do I want to be doing? Do I, do I still want to do this? Is this, you know, where I want to be? So it's not like I say in a year, I want to be doing this or that. And maybe that's not a good thing. Maybe that's why it takes me so long to do everything. I mean, eight years on a movie is a long time. But it, it's more organic for me. It's the way I work. Did you have any type of premonition or feeling that the blacklist would be so well received? Or was it again something that you were very passionate about finding out more? It, it was something that uh, fascinated me. And because uh, I came into Hollywood and experienced what was the tail end of the, of the people who had been blacklisted, I studied with an amazing, wonderful uh, acting teacher named Jeff Corey, who had been blacklisted. He was an actor who had been blacklisted. And I didn't know much about the blacklist, but all his students knew that the only reason that Jeff was teaching was because he was blacklisted, because otherwise he would have been such a working actor that none of us would have had the benefit of his gifts. And so there was a kind of an interest for me because of that. And then um, I met a woman who told me that her husband had been blacklisted. And she started telling me stories about the blacklist. And suddenly I was hearing names that I was dealing with in Hollywood as an actress. These were people that I had auditioned for, people that I had read for, you know, that I had worked for. And I thought, wow, this is all like been dusted under the rug somewhere. Nobody, nobody talks about this now. And so I said, are any of these people still around? And she introduced me to the entire blacklist community. And I found them to be some of the most wonderful, creative, smart people. And then I realized as I started delving into this, these people had made some of the great movies that had influenced my life as a child. And where were they now? They weren't working. And movies had taken a big swing in a very superficial direction, you know, the it was the the age of the beach blanket bingo movies, the the uh, the, the Elvis movies, and movies had just gone into a very superficial place at that time. And as an actress, I had wondered, you know, where were all these great parts, like these women who had had great parts in these movies? Well, they weren't written anymore, and the writers who wrote them weren't around anymore, but they were alive but they couldn't work. And so that became a very interesting subject matter for me. And again, to the credit of AFI, I took my camera equipment and I went out and shot an interview with this one woman and submitted it to AFI and they gave me a grant to start the movie. So that's how the blacklist got off the ground. So it sounds like a similar parallel with the girls in the band because you dipped your toe in the water, you became very intrigued with the subject. Exactly. Matter. Starts with one interview yeah. and then goes from there. Yeah. Wow. Do you think any type of blacklist exists today? Maybe for different reasons? I don't really know that. I, I keep seeing things in, in the papers uh, saying blacklist but it has some other kind of meaning. It doesn't have the same kind of meaning as what was happening in the, in the 40s and the 50s in this country, because that was political. That was government inspired. Whatever blacklist there is now, that's internecine warfare inside of studios with agents and stars and stuff like that. And it doesn't have the gravitas 
of what happened in the 40s and 50s. Yeah, you were nominated for an Emmy Award? Yes. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. For the Blacklist. Was that something that you ever envisioned, or was that a goal of yours, or it just happened because you were so passionate about the film, the interviews, that it showed on screen? You know, while you're making these things, it, somewhere in the back of your mind, you're hoping you'll get recognition for them. And a lot of people were saying to me, oh, you're going to get nominated for this. I know you're going to get nominated for this. And I always kind of put that into a nice little compartment on the side and say, oh, that would be really nice if that happened. But that's not why I'm doing it. And then six o'clock in the morning one day, my phone rings with a friend saying, you just got nominated. <laughs> and I thought, whoa, okay, that's great. So it was great. What were some of the lessons that you took from doing the blacklist onto future projects, either pros and cons, things you never would do again or that you would definitely repeat? Well, the blacklist project took me 10 years. And after I finished it, I said, you know, I can't do another project now that's going to take me 10 years. I just need to do something different. And so I went into the commercial world and worked in all those other jobs that sustained a career for me and, you know, got me into the Director's Guild and did a lot of nice things for my career. But um, I knew that if I got into another so-called passion project, that it was going to take a lot of years of my life. And so I didn't want to do that for a long time. I did a lot of other documentaries, but they were short, quick things, mostly for television, mostly documentaries for hire. And it wasn't till this project came along that I said, okay, I know what this is going to take out of me, but I'm ready to do it again. That was a long time. Judy, where were you raised? I was raised in Los Angeles, in East Los Angeles, actually, Boyle Heights, mm -hmm. East LA, man. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about some of the mindset that your parents instilled in terms of work ethic and creativity. Uh, my parents were both artists. Uh, not successful artists, because we were living in East LA, obviously, they weren't that successful. And they had to work at other day jobs. But my father was a photographer, and my mother was a writer and a songwriter, and they gave all their children, there were four of us, intense music lessons and dance lessons for me and my sister. And when I started to show some ability in theater, they encouraged me to go into the theater. And they had very high standards, and we were trained classically. So we were not trained to do anything uh, in the pop vein. They looked down their noses at anything that was pop oriented. Um, so we all had very classical training and it, it left an impact on me. And you know, when I would do anything that wasn't up to my mother's standards, she, she, would, she would be very, um, very quietly critical and say, is that the best you can do? Oh, <laughs> you know, so uh, the goals and the standards that were set for us were very high. And I think that's why I choose to do these kind of documentaries that are sort of large in scope, that have a kind of a classical approach to them that hopefully will last and have some kind of impact because of that training that I was given. What did you also witness from your parents about, I guess you'd call it the artistic struggle in terms of holding those day jobs, but really your heart was somewhere else? Well, I knew that, that the world was very hard for them. It was very hard because emotionally and artistically their passions were stilted by circumstance. I mean, they had four children. They were, they themselves were products of the depression. Um, their their parents were um, foreign born. They were first generation American, both of them, and they, I think they felt that part of what they had to do in life 
was carve a better future for their children. And they did that. All my brothers and sisters are all in the arts. We have all sustained ourselves as artists. And we're still trying to prove something to our parents, but we're grateful to them too. So we were looking through Bust Magazine online. Oh, Bust Magazine, yeah. yes. <laughs> and you were quoted as saying, they call it the glass ceiling, but I call it the brick wall in terms of being a female filmmaker. So what do you think are some of the things that make it tougher for women and what are some of the things that we can do to break down those barriers or maybe we're not there yet? Well, the thing that makes it really tough is that you don't get a chance to be uh, part of the club. You know, every business has its club that nurtures new young people who come in and somebody wants to pass on the knowledge. Well, nobody wants to pass it on to a girl in, in the movie business. They just don't, it, you're not part of the club. And if you're not part of the club, it's very hard to learn your craft. And it's hard to be an insider and it's hard to get to the place where you can even get a chance to prove yourself as a director. So that's why I call it a brick wall because there, there is very limited resources. Now, that's not to say they're not, they don't exist because as you can see, some women are really breaking through in big ways. But generally, unless you have some kind of special in, you're not going to get there just by being good or being talented or doing everything right. It's just not there for you. So that's the brick wall and I think if you look at it as a brick wall and you say, well, I'm going to stop butting my head against this brick wall and I'm going to find another way to do this, that's where you go out and you find some other way. And for me, doing documentaries is the other way to do it or to do any of the other things that I do, like I direct in theater and, uh, you know, wherever else that I possibly can. And that's, that's my answer for myself. I think everybody has to find their own answer. but. That's what I've found. You said you think that maybe it's a system designed to make women fail? Well, yeah, you know, I, I really take that from the, the comment that Amy Pascal made in the news the other day, or that she was quoted as saying that the system is set up for women to fail, and that's because that same thing, there is no process by which you can automatically move up the ladder. And that isn't to say that it's not hard. It's hard for men to move up the ladder too. But if you feel that you're a really gifted filmmaker and that that's what you're meant to do in life, then there should be ways for you to pursue that. And when you get out there and you don't find any ways open to you, that's, that's where the system is, is set up for you to fail. Forgive me, I, I remember we had the conversation ahead of time when we were talking about the article. I didn't mean to put words in your mouth, but we were discussing that. How do you think that the system is designed for women to fail in terms of what Amy's article was? Well, about? even if you get a shot at it mm -hmm. and you don't have the support that you need in order to be successful, then the, the, the chances of failure are pretty big. And especially if you come onto a set where everyone's hostile to you. Um, you know, I didn't used to believe that that was going to happen. I used to think, well, you know, I'm a really good person to work for. People love to work with me. I can get on a set and, you know, every, I'll make everybody feel good and we'll all work well together. Well, the first time that I came onto a set of a commercial television show, I found enormous hostility hostility by men on the crew who wanted to do what I was doing and they had been laboring on this particular show for two years, three years and who is this chick coming in who's doing the job that I don't get to do and a lot of undermining went on and that was a bit of a shock to me. So the setup to fail exists out there. Right, I've noticed that whenever you do encounter hostility, whatever field it's in, it's usually because somebody wants to be right where you are. Exactly. And that's an interesting lesson. There's a select few of women that are allowed in. What do you think the difference has been? Well, you know, everybody has their own path in life. 
And some of the women that I know who are successful have come up through the inside of the business, come up as script supervisors, and in that way, they've built a community from within that has supported them, which is, that's a wonderful way to come in. Others have been producers and have come in that way. And, you know, um, maybe uh, somebody has done some remarkable bit of work in the theater that has brought them to the attention of some major director who has been willing to help them. Uh, or has been an assistant to a major director, and I think that in those instances, there has been a man there who has been willing to say, yes, I will help this woman in. But without that, without that kind of mentor in the business, it's, it's pretty difficult. Do you think that's what interests you so much in hearing about these female jazz musicians, is some of the parallels? I realize it was a different time then, and racism played a huge part in their lives at that point. It still does, I'm sure, but it, do you think that's where you really felt a kinship? I did feel a kinship with them. I felt that they were going through exactly what I was going through. So it was, uh, when I saw that, I said, hey, this is not just my story or the women's musician's story. This is the women's story. This is our story. And I think that one of the things that I would like to do is encourage women to make up their own world. You know, we have to hold up our end of the world and we have to create a world in which we work and in which we feel comfortable. And there are a lot of men who are willing to support us. I've had the support of many wonderful men on this project. But it's because we are telling our story and our story needs to be told. The world is out of balance and we got to help get it in balance. Judy, when you walk into an environment, how would you know where to set up the interview, how close to frame the camera, things like that? What would you be going through in your mind? Well, I, I generally work with a, a cinematographer and we discuss, you know, the, the basics that you want in an interview where you want some depth of field, you don't want anybody sitting up against a flat wall and, you know, we know the basics of what it takes to make a shot look good. And we just work around it and tweak around it and pick an angle. And if it didn't work, we'd pick something else. It's a creative moment. And, uh, you know, you just get into it. I, I don't have preconceived ideas. I come into the environment and uh, discuss with my cameraman and say, you know, what do we have? What are our options? Most of the time when you're in environment in an environment that is uh, not a shooting environment, you're dealing with the, the limitations. And so it's working within those limitations to try to find the best shot, the best angle. What are some of the things you're doing to put your subject, for lack of a better word, at ease and build a rapport with them? You have a quick amount of time, maybe you've had no prior correspondence beforehand? Well, I never do an interview that I haven't had a correspondence in advance. I've always talked to the person, either in person or on the telephone. I always have a really uh, deep knowledge of them, of their career, of their history, of where they fit into this story, of what their interview, uh, what I need their interview to do, because you're always carrying the story in your head and in your heart. You, you, and you emotionally are attached to the idea that you're trying to present. and you are looking for subjects to flesh out that idea. You know, the idea that um, you go out there and you just shoot a bunch of stuff and then you go in a cutting room and cut it is a little naive because you have to have somewhere in your psyche a story that you want to tell and you have to know how the people that you're interviewing fit into the telling of that story. So. Um, that's, that's what you come to the interview with. Then when you sit with the person that you're interviewing, you've already established some rapport with them, either by direct conversation or on the telephone, and um, they have a sense of where you're going with the interview. It's very important that they be comfortable with where you're going, that you're not going to go in and ask them some personal salacious question that is going to shut them off. Because if you get into areas where people are uh, shocked or surprised at what you say, I mean, that's not the kind of filmmaker I am. 
Some people like to do that. They like to shock and surprise their uh, subjects. But I find that if you're trying to tell your story, that turns people off. So I try to take them into areas where they will fulfill the needs of the story. And um, then I just let them talk, just like you do. <laughs> In terms of using certain footage versus not using, what was your test to know this isn't going to work, it's great, I love it, but this, for the film, it just won't work? This is the hardest, hardest part, and that's where you need a great editor, and I was fortunate to have a great editor. Edward Osejima, who was named in the New York Times Review as a brilliant editor, deserves that accolade. Um, you know, we had probably 300 hours of footage between interviews and uh, stock footage and stills and performances. And Edward and I talked a lot about structure, about how we saw this, about how it was defined in a three-act format. And this, again, is where my formal training comes in. You know, I have a real sense of beginning, middle, and end, and narrative structure, and threads that weave through. And Edward and I talked about this, about where I saw the first act ending, where I felt the second act ended, what the third act was, and what the narrative threads were through the whole thing, which, as you know, racism comes into it, and the woman, women's struggle comes into it, and the music world comes into it. So we had a pretty good meeting of the minds about what the thematic things of the film would be and what the structure would be. And then I gave everything to Edward and said, okay, start cutting. And he would come to me every day with pieces that he had cut. And, you know, some of them I would just be in heaven with what he had done. Other ones I didn't think they quite worked. Other things I wanted in, he fought against. Other things he thought were really good, I fought against. We had a really creatively combative situation, which I find to be the best way to work with somebody else. You know, not that everybody, not that your editor says everything you want is wonderful, but that your editor has creative ideas of their own. And that was the process, and that was the most enjoyable process. Uh, the editing process was just really fabulous. So your editor should not be a yes man or woman. Exactly. They, they should, you know, assert themselves Exactly. In some ways. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How can you tell, though, if somebody wants complete control of it? I mean, how do you find that balance? Well, if they're not listening to you, if they're not hearing what you're saying, and they're coming back with something that has nothing to do with what you asked for, then you know you've got the wrong editor. But with Edward, whatever he came back with was what I asked for and more. So I thought, oh my God, you know, he's taking this to places that I hadn't even envisioned. And that's, that's what you want from your editor. Judy, how important is the role of a producer? Well, not enough can be said about the person who's the actual hands-on producer who works with you on a day-to-day -day basis. And for me, that is, uh, my producer is Nancy Kissick. And Nancy and I were friends long before this and had worked on a short film together. We did a narrative film together uh, back in, Oh, 2001, something like that. And um, when I started working on this, it became apparent to me that while I have been able to be a producer and a director on many projects, that this was going to be too overwhelming. And Nancy came on, and I just put all the day-to-day -day burdens on her shoulders. She's the one who set up that uh, shoot in New York of the Harlem Steps you know, the poster of the photo. That was three months' work of Nancy on the phone just organizing that. She's the one who takes care of all the financial matters, who keeps us straight, who, who keeps my head on straight. And then she has incredible taste. So every time Edward and I would do a cut, we'd haul Nancy in there, and she would sit down and watch the cut with us and her comments were usually just spot on. You know, she knows how to just say the right thing. So having somebody like that on your team 
is so important because even you and the editor, you know, you get so deeply immersed in it that you can't see it anymore. And having one other person with great taste who has the project's best interest at heart, that's what a great producer does for you. That's what, what Nancy did for us. And how long have you known her? I've known Nancy for probably mm, 25 years, but we just knew each other on a friendship basis. She had worked for a major advertising agency, and my husband was working with them as well, doing the music for a lot of their commercials. And so we met socially, and um, we were at parties together and just you know, kind of hit it off with a friendship. And um, she went on to do a lot of, <coughs> excuse me, other producing. And when I was going to do my short film, I uh, called her and said, I need a producer. So I called Nancy and asked her if she would want to produce that for me. She did. And once we worked together, I started thinking, you know, I'd like to work with her again. So that's what we did. What are some traits that are great in producers that you would advise other filmmakers to look for, even if they don't have a long IMDb list? The producer has to be someone who is there to support your vision and not to pull the film in another direction. That's one of the great gifts that Nancy has. She's there to support my vision. And she knows how to do it when it's required. She keeps me from falling through a lot of traps, falling through holes, making mistakes. She remembers stuff that I forget. It's, uh, you know, it's a real wonderful support. And that's what you need. Proactive and on top of things. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Proactive on top of things, but knows not to try to take it away from the director. Mm -hmm. that's, that's hard. How would you recommend one find a producer? Boy, that's a mystery that I have never been able to advise anybody or solve for anybody. You get out there and have a career and you'll meet people who will come into your life and come into your circle of, of people that you will want to work with. And you'll try working with them and if they don't work out, it, they'll go by the wayside. But eventually you find the group that you want to work with. And it's just trial and error and hit and miss. There's not a place you go, we, producers are us, you know, <laughs> that you can just rent a producer. It's finding the right person who you can work with. What, do you, what are some of the things you have to do to keep a producer happy? I mean, it's like any relationship. It's, it's probably a lot of give and take and some good days, some bad days. Well, I keep my producer happy by feeding her lunch every day. <laughs> I make lunch for my entire crew. Oh, wow. That's I do. Wonderful. This started out as a lark because people work here in my studio office, and I didn't want them having to go out, have lunch, find a place to eat, drive, come back. And, you know, it's not like in walking distance there's some places to eat. So I just started, you know, making lunch or letting them fix lunch for themselves. But it seems to have turned into a wonderful part of our day. And it's a time where we all get to sit together and talk together as a group. And you know, this is interesting, this new thing that happened with the CEO of Google, where she now wants people all to come into the office and work together. I don't know if you know about this. Well, you know, everybody's home, working from their home now because you can. Everybody's in a virtual office. Well, the new CEO of Google realized that something was missing by doing this and she decided to have people come back into an office and work together. And in doing that, you start to talk about things that don't come up when you're in a virtual office. And we find that here, that, you know, yesterday I threw out a problem to my four people who were sitting out in the patio having lunch, and I said, okay, we've got a problem here. How are we gonna solve this? I had come up with three or four thoughts on my own, around the table, they came up with five or six more thoughts. And by the end of the day, we were implementing them. So, uh, you know, there's a difference between being virtual and being real. That's, that's how I like to work with my people.